Good afternoon and greetings from Johannesburg, where I am recording this video for you. I am Shelley Barry, and I am mainly known as an experimental filmmaker, although I do um, make films in all genres. And um, I'm also often known for shooting films on my mobile phone. So today I'm going to speak to you a little bit about experimental cinema particularly and mobile phone production. Um, and let me just start telling you a little bit about myself so that you know a little bit about, about my story. So um, I, as I said, I'm a filmmaker and I also lecture at the University of Johannesburg I, where I teach uh, cinema. And I have a production company called Two Spinning Wheels. It's a production company that has focused on marginalized voices having access to the craft of cinema. So I also do a lot of training work, a lot of mentoring work, and ensure that the films that I make um, insert images into a mainstream media that tends to leave those images out. So um, just uh, more about my background is that um, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker from, from the first time I saw a film at the age of eight um, at the local cinema in Gebecha. And, um, and yeah, it was always my dream. I was just very, I was one of those people who were just very sure of, of knowing what I wanted to do with my life and, and what I wanted to make and what I wanted to be. But uh, it took a long time for this to actually materialize because at the time growing up um, in the 70s uh, in a part of South Africa, um, there weren't that many opportunities, especially for studying film. And um, it, it came to me very, very late in life. Actually, only at the age of 32, I had the opportunity to study film. But before that happened, uh, my dream, you know, my dream of becoming a filmmaker was quite shattered um, on the 17th of January, 1996, when I was caught in a crossfire um, in a taxi turf war in Cape Town. I was traveling in a minibus taxi with my partner at the time, uh, Janine Clayton, and um, we were in the front seat next to the driver um, and a fellow taxi, minibus taxi pulled up next to us and opened fire at point blank range and we were both shot. All three of us, the driver died, unfortunately, um, and um, Janine and I survived. I, however, um, would never walk again. And I have two disabilities. One is uh, I'm paralyzed, so I use a wheelchair. I've been using a wheelchair now for 26 years. And I have a second disability, which is more of an invisible disability, and that is that I speak through a valve. Um, which is situated here in my throat. Um, it's a speaking valve that allows for you to hear me. Um, and I really don't know what I would have done without this valve. Um, and I made a film about it. I'll tell you a little bit more about that soon. And um, so obviously it was a very difficult time and a devastating time. And one of the questions I had to ask myself was, well, how am I going to make films now? I was 24 at the time. I'm now 51. Um, and at the time, I was very devastated and depressed and spent several months in hospital. And while I was in hospital, I sort of had to think to myself, well, what am I going to do now? Who makes films in a wheelchair? It's like it's not a thing. Um, and I need to think of what am I going to do with my life because my dreams are shattered. My life is over. I just wanted to die, quite frankly. But after weeks and months of, of being in the ICU ward, and obviously you have a lot of time to think, I started wondering, well, why can't I be a filmmaker in a wheelchair? And that just means that um, my angles will be different. And what's wrong with that? So I sort of had to challenge my own mindset about about how you make films and who gets to make films and how they get to make films. And that sort of really was a, a turning point for me. Um, at the same time, I'd also been introduced to the work of Frida Kahlo, a Mexican artist. I'm sure several of you know who she is or uh, was. Um, and 
And I was inspired by the fact that she made most of her work as a woman with a disability. Um, and um, that sort of changed my perspective about things. And I thought, well, if she could do it, you know, maybe I can do it too. Um, so it took a while. Um, came out of hospital sometime in '96. I did. Uh, I managed to get involved in the disability rights movement, which I felt was very politically important for me at the time because I realized that being being in a uh, in this particular body in a world that invisibilizes this body, there was no way that you could be apolitical about it. So I, I became involved in the disability rights movement and that really took my all my attention for several years. But I always knew that I still had this dream, right? And um, there I was in film school. I had never made a film in my life. I was very inexperienced. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was in a class full of students who had had some experience. I felt really that sort of behind uh, the times and um, I was quite insular so I started making forms in my bedroom I had a little camcorder like literally that big you know a little Sony video recorder and I started making films that way in the spaces in which I found myself so that started with my bedroom um, where I literally would experiment um, with making films in that space or I would take the camcorder with me Wherever I went and wherever I found myself, I could create in that way. Um, and this is how my early work was really birthed. It was birthed out of necessity. It was birthed out of um, creating the opportunity to make work, um, um, in, 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 mostly in isolation or just with my partner at the time or... Um, wherever I found myself, as I said. So I'm going to be sharing with you the links to that early work. Um, and you can you can have a look at that. I'm not going to go into it here because of time. But you can see how my early work is done with some of the basics of experimental cinema. And the basics of experimental cinema really is tends to be um, people who work in very, very small crews. It tends to be a domestic environment. Um, it tends to be very low budget or no budget. Um, not that there's really such thing as no budget, but low budget. Um, so it's not a whole big production with extensive crews and um, masses of equipment and cords strewn all over the place. It's quite a, a cinema of intimacy, I would say. And and experimental cinema is also anti-narrative structure in terms of a normal mainstream three-act structure. It's very much, the word itself says it all, which is experimenting. So experimental cinema is all about playing, really. Playing, innovating, sort of seeing the world through different eyes and and trying to look at a different angle of things. So when you make experimental cinema, you don't have the pressure that you have when you make films that are more mainstream. Because when you're making films that are more mainstream, there's this pressure for it to look a certain way and to use certain cinematic grammar. And it's all pretty and packaged and has a storyline and all of that. Experimental cinema throws all of that out of the window and says um, there's no structure here. There's no specific structure here. I'm not following any particular rules or any particular grammar about filmmaking. And this is what's really exciting about experimental cinema is because you can really explore your own um, creative expression and your own authentic voice. This does not mean that experimental cinema is not without a concept. Um, so it's not just necessarily random, throwing random images together, um, although that's also possible if you want to do that. But it is it tends to be more conceptual in terms of its content as opposed to sort of traditional or mainstream cin cinema. 
And this is what I've always really enjoyed about um, experimental films because, first of all, it's not really something that you see on a regular basis. When I was first introduced to experimental cinema, I was very excited about it. Um, it was at film school. Um, and if you do have an opportunity, please check out the work of sort of the pioneers of experimental cinema, um, Stan Brackage, uh, Marie Menken, uh, Maya Deren. Uh, also, um, I've enjoyed the work of Jonas Mekas. Uh, here in South Africa, we have the wonderful Jyoti Mystery. And you just want to maybe just, a lot of their work is online. You can explore some of their work and see how experimental cinema appeals to you um, or not. So, as I said, I'm going to leave several links of my films where you can watch it and see, you know, see what you, what you think about it and feel free to engage with me. Um, my email address is twospinningwheels at gmail.com, twospinningwheels at gmail.com. And um, I, look, uh, I very much look uh, forward to interaction and engagement. So just to recap, experimental cinema is often done in small crews. It is often inexpensive. It is often filmed in a domestic environment. It is not doesn't co adhere to any narrative structure as such, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have a concept behind it. It is an exploration of creative expression. It is not commercially commercially driven. So it's not trying to make money, believe me, you are not going to make money from experimental film. And if you do, it is sure is a miracle. Um, but it's just not, not impossible, nothing is impossible. Um, and yeah, so some of the some of the advice some, some advice I would give to you if you want to make experimental film is use your phone. Your phone is right there, it's a video camera in your pocket, even if it isn't the greatest quality. You can literally do everything on your phone these days, and I'm sure several of you are already producing content that way. Um, you can shoot, edit, upload everything on your phone. And I think, I think for me, the greatest gift that experimental cinema gives is that it doesn't have that kind of pressure, it doesn't have that commercial pressure on it where it's supposed to look all slick and perfect and you know, with the most beautiful pans that take your breath away. It's not about perfection. It is about explore, exploration. It is about uh, um, bringing your unique angle, vision, voice to, uh, to something. It is about making something that probably only you could make. Um, so therefore, it also tends to be a personal form of expression. And that is why the mobile phone and experimental cinema are really such a good match because it has that thing of where you can just make work um, as you're moving along in life without tons of pre-planning, without spending massive amount of money, um, while being open to the moment. Um, experimental cinema is also not really planned or scripted, although it can be. Um, but sometimes you'll just record something. Often I work like that where I record something and then make something with it afterwards. So um, so I, that's, that's my advice to you is to don't wait for eternity and think, oh, one day I'm going to make this amazing film and it's going to be such a hit and I'm going to win all these awards and it's going to be amazing and everyone's going to think I'm so fabulous. Just make work. That is my advice to you. Just make work. Use your phone. Okay, I do use, this is my phone at the moment. I do use Samsung S21. Um, I know there's an S22 out at the moment. That's my video camera. That's how I'm making work. And therefore, the, the links I'm going to share with you are mostly made on a mobile phone, except for my earlier work. So I leave you to engage um, with my films. And with the notion of experimental cinema, there's lots of information online, several films online uh, where you can watch experimental films. I mentioned some filmmakers to you that I think are worth checking out. And I would love to engage and look forward to chatting with you more. I also mentor students, not only in experimental cinema, but 
in any genre uh, from fiction to doc or if you're just trying to figure your idea out um, I'm also available for mentoring so please as I said do be in touch thank you very much and have a blessed 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 week